Are you having sleepless nights? Many of us encounter troubles when attempting to fall asleep on a nightly basis. Without a great night's sleep, we could face various obstacles the next day. What is keeping you awake? Here are a few possible reasons. 1. Messy bedroom. 2. Naps throughout the day. 3. Skipping breakfast. These are just a few of the possible reasons. Here are three different ways to fall asleep quicker at night. Progressive muscle relaxation. This relaxation technique involves tightening and tense all the muscle groups that you can, and then relax them. By doing so repeatedly, we are able to promote physical relaxation which will also provide beneficial results in our day-to-day -day activities. Progressive muscle relaxation provides you with less tension within your muscles, lower blood pressure, decreased levels of anxiety, overall lower levels of fatigue. Through doing this exercise nightly you are physically relaxing yourself as well as calming your mind. Don't use your mobile as an alarm, we've all done it most of it still doing it on a nightly basis. The truth is using our mobile phones as an alarm clock is infected prying us from sleep. Most of us are keen to have our devices on us at all times whether we are exchanging texts or sending and receiving emails. By keeping our mobile devices within reach at night, we are keeping our minds and muscles engaged. Due to the engagement right before bed you will find yourself taking longer to fall asleep. Sleep is all about relaxation and while we all would like to remain involved those messages throughout the night are subconsciously waking us up in an action known as arousal. This is the process of the mind awakening without the body and in most cases we are completely unaware of it the next day. Listen to soothing sounds. Our bodies are more apt for sounds when we are conscious trying to fall asleep rather than when we are dozed off. If your sleeping problem is due to excessive background noise, you may find peace by listening to soothing background music. Once you find the routine that best helps you fall asleep, you should follow it consistently. Once our bodies are trained to follow our sleep habits, we will find ourselves falling asleep quicker. Are you having sleepless nights? Many of us encounter troubles when attempting to fall asleep on a nightly basis. Without a great night's sleep, we could face various obstacles the next day. What is keeping you awake? Here are a few possible reasons. 1. Messy bedroom. 2. Naps throughout the day. 3. Skipping breakfast. These are just a few of the possible reasons. Here are three different ways to fall asleep quicker at night. Progressive muscle relaxation. This relaxation technique involves tightening and tense all the muscle groups that you can, and then relax them. By doing so repeatedly, we are able to promote physical relaxation which will also provide beneficial results in our day-to-day -day activities. Progressive muscle relaxation provides you with less tension within your muscles, lower blood pressure, decreased levels of anxiety, overall lower levels of fatigue. Through doing this exercise nightly you are physically relaxing yourself as well as calming your mind. Don't use your mobile as an alarm, we've all done it most of it still doing it on a nightly basis. The truth is using our mobile phones as an alarm clock is infected prying us from sleep. Most of us are keen to have our devices on us at all times whether we are exchanging texts or sending and receiving emails. By keeping our mobile devices within reach at night, we are keeping our minds and muscles engaged. Due to the engagement right before bed you will find yourself taking longer to fall asleep. Sleep is all about relaxation and while we all would like to remain involved those messages throughout the night are subconsciously waking us up in an action known as arousal. This is the process of the mind awakening without the body and in most cases we are completely unaware of it the next day. Listen to soothing sounds. Our bodies are more apt for sounds when we are conscious trying to fall asleep rather than when we are dozed off. If your sleeping problem is due to excessive background noise, you may find peace by listening to soothing background music. Once you find the routine that best helps you fall asleep, you should follow it consistently. Once our bodies are trained to follow our sleep habits, we will find ourselves falling asleep quicker. The greatest number of loggerhead turtles may be found in the waters off the coast of the United States. 
Since 1978, this wide-ranging seagoer has been on the endangered species list because of pollution, shrimp trawling, and development in its nesting grounds. They can be found all across the world's oceans, save for the very coldest. They appear to favor coastal areas, although they are also found in inland waterways and may migrate hundreds of kilometers out to sea. Leatherback turtles are the biggest hard-shelled turtles, yet their shells are soft. Large heads, powerful jaws, and a reddish-brown shell, or carapace, are all characteristics of loggerhead sharks. Sizable individuals weighing over 1,000 pounds have been discovered, although the average adult male is about 3 feet long and roughly 250 pounds in weight. Carnivorous jellyfish, conches, crabs and even fish are their preferred prey, although they'll also consume seaweed and sargassum. To deposit their eggs, mature females return to the beach where they hatched, often thousands of kilometers away. Scientists observing nesting populations have noticed significant declines despite the existence of laws protecting the species as endangered. The greatest number of loggerhead turtles may be found in the waters off the coast of the United States. Since 1978, this wide-ranging seagoer has been on the endangered species list because of pollution, shrimp trawling, and development in its nesting grounds. They can be found all across the world's oceans, save for the very coldest. They appear to favor coastal areas, although they are also found in inland waterways and may migrate hundreds of kilometers out to sea. Leatherback turtles are the biggest hard-shelled turtles, yet their shells are soft. Large heads, powerful jaws, and a reddish-brown shell, or carapace, are all characteristics of loggerhead sharks. Sizable individuals weighing over 1,000 pounds have been discovered, although the average adult male is about 3 feet long and roughly 250 pounds in weight. Carnivorous jellyfish, conches, crabs and even fish are their preferred prey, although they'll also consume seaweed and sargassum. To deposit their eggs, mature females return to the beach where they hatched, often thousands of kilometers away. Scientists observing nesting populations have noticed significant declines despite the existence of laws protecting the species as endangered. Placement, layering, and integration are common to most current money laundering strategies. Placement is the process through which ill-gotten gains are transformed into assets that appear to be lawful. Depositing money into a bank account registered to an anonymous company or a professional intermediary is a common method of accomplishing this. Because of the sudden infusion of enormous funds into the financial system, this is the stage of the criminal enterprise where the greatest risk of detection exists. Using several transactions to further obscure the source of funds is the second phase in this process, which is known as layering. For example, the acquisition of marketable property like luxury automobiles, artwork and real estate might be a form of this. Layering is common at casinos, too, because of the high volume of transactions. If a money launderer has a gambling account at a casino chain's facilities in other countries or works with personnel to rig the games, they may be able to do so. Finally, integration permits clean money to return to the mainstream economy and benefit the original criminal. Investing in a legitimate firm and claiming payment through fictitious invoices is one option, another is to create an unregistered charitable organization, where they may command a hefty salary by serving on the board of directors.
Placement, layering, and integration are common to most current money laundering strategies. Placement is the process through which ill-gotten gains are transformed into assets that appear to be lawful. Depositing money into a bank account registered to an anonymous company or a professional intermediary is a common method of accomplishing this. Because of the sudden infusion of enormous funds into the financial system, this is the stage of the criminal enterprise where the greatest risk of detection exists. Using several transactions to further obscure the source of funds is the second phase in this process, which is known as layering. For example, the acquisition of marketable property like luxury automobiles, artwork and real estate might be a form of this. Layering is common at casinos, too, because of the high volume of transactions. If a money launderer has a gambling account at a casino chain's facilities in other countries or works with personnel to rig the games, they may be able to do so. Finally, integration permits clean money to return to the mainstream economy and benefit the original criminal. Investing in a legitimate firm and claiming payment through fictitious invoices is one option, another is to create an unregistered charitable organization, where they may command a hefty salary by serving on the board of directors. Our borders should be open, in my opinion. European governments should at the very least offer a legal path for workers from poor nations to come and work in the EU. Eventually, I hope, we'll be able to have truly open borders. It will be difficult to persuade doubters. Because of this, I believe the case for unrestricted immigration must be presented on several levels. Freedom and justice are both enhanced by this instance. This is an instance of humanitarian assistance to those who are far less fortunate than we are. Economically, it helps us to be more prosperous. It's in everyone's best advantage to make the most of the situation, because it's inescapable. Human rights and international solidarity aren't the only reasons why people should be able to roam freely. In the long run, it is in our best advantage to do so. It's possible that widening our boundaries won't be feasible. But this was also true once when it came to the abolition of slavery or the right to vote for women. Our moment demands that we fight for the right of all people to cast their ballots without interference. Our borders should be open, in my opinion. European governments should at the very least offer a legal path for workers from poor nations to come and work in the EU. Eventually, I hope, we'll be able to have truly open borders. It will be difficult to persuade doubters. Because of this, I believe the case for unrestricted immigration must be presented on several levels. Freedom and justice are both enhanced by this instance. This is an instance of humanitarian assistance to those who are far less fortunate than we are. Economically, it helps us to be more prosperous. It's in everyone's best advantage to make the most of the situation, because it's inescapable. Human rights and international solidarity aren't the only reasons why people should be able to roam freely. In the long run, it is in our best advantage to do so. It's possible that widening our boundaries won't be feasible. But this was also true once when it came to the abolition of slavery or the right to vote for women. Our moment demands that we fight for the right of all people to cast their ballots without interference. Let us now turn our attention to magazines instead of newspapers. It was in London in 1704 that The Review, a modest periodical called The Review, first appeared. Despite its appearance, this newspaper was rather distinct from others of its day in terms of its substance and ideas it presented. The Review's concentration was on key domestic issues and the policies of the administration, rather than news events. People might still be imprisoned in England at the time if they published writings unfavourable of the monarch. It occurred to Daniel Defoe as well. The review was founded by him, and he was a vocal advocate for the publication's mission. The inaugural edition of the review was really written by Defoe in jail. 
For his writings that were critical of the church in England, which was ruled by King Henry VIII, he had been imprisoned and exiled. Even after Defoe was freed from prison, he continued to work on the review and the publication began to appear three times a week. As soon as the first magazine appeared, others followed suit. The first issue of The Tatler, a magazine, appeared in 1709. Poems, news, political commentary, and philosophical writings were all featured in this new publication. Let us now turn our attention to magazines instead of newspapers. It was in London in 1704 that The Review, a modest periodical called The Review, first appeared. Despite its appearance, this newspaper was rather distinct from others of its day in terms of its substance and ideas it presented. The Review's concentration was on key domestic issues and the policies of the administration, rather than news events. People might still be imprisoned in England at the time if they published writings unfavourable of the monarch. It occurred to Daniel Defoe as well. The review was founded by him, and he was a vocal advocate for the publication's mission. The inaugural edition of the review was really written by Defoe in jail. For his writings that were critical of the church in England, which was ruled by King Henry VIII, he had been imprisoned and exiled. Even after Defoe was freed from prison, he continued to work on the review and the publication began to appear three times a week. As soon as the first magazine appeared, others followed suit. The first issue of The Tatler, a magazine, appeared in 1709. Poems, news, political commentary, and philosophical writings were all featured in this new publication. Playful snarls from another dog are mimicked when this dog approaches food. Despite the dog's curiosity, it doesn't seem to be put off by the sound of the bone. Despite hearing the growls of another dog being approached by a stranger, this one nevertheless grabs the bone. Playing the sound of a dog guarding its meal back in another circumstance, a dog's bark is heard. After another round of growling, the dog finally backs off. Dogs appear to be able to differentiate between different sorts of growls, according to these studies. Playful snarls from another dog are mimicked when this dog approaches food. Despite the dog's curiosity, it doesn't seem to be put off by the sound of the bone. Despite hearing the growls of another dog being approached by a stranger, this one nevertheless grabs the bone. Playing the sound of a dog guarding its meal back in another circumstance, a dog's bark is heard. After another round of growling, the dog finally backs off. Dogs appear to be able to differentiate between different sorts of growls, according to these studies. We've discovered that the makeup of ecosystems all throughout the world is changing at a considerably faster rate than we anticipated. Certainly, far faster than ecological theory anticipates. Anne McGurran of the University of St Andrews in Scotland is a biologist. We still don't know what will happen as a result of this. 
We believe it will be linked to a decrease in resilience in these assemblages, but there are still many unanswered concerns concerning the repercussions of such fast biodiversity change. And what this means is that if we care about conservation, we must do more than simply list species. Changes in the abundances and identities of the species that live in these environments must also be tracked. Conservation biologists will need to keep note of the species they encounter in these locations. And policymakers will have to be willing to adjust their policies to reflect these developments. McGurran and colleagues are working to create the BioTime database, a storehouse for data on ecological groups and populations, as well as how they are evolving through time. At the World Economic Forum in Davos on January 26, McGurran chatted with Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Mariette Di Cristina. MD, I'm a medical doctor, and the data set will be available soon? A. M. Yes, the data set will be made public. It's an open access data set, which means it may be used for study, teaching, and conservation by anybody in the globe. And we'd be glad to work with anyone who has data and wants to join us or contribute in any manner to the data set's preservation. We've discovered that the makeup of ecosystems all throughout the world is changing at a considerably faster rate than we anticipated. Certainly, far faster than ecological theory anticipates. Anne McGurran of the University of St Andrews in Scotland is a biologist. We still don't know what will happen as a result of this. We believe it will be linked to a decrease in resilience in these assemblages, but there are still many unanswered concerns concerning the repercussions of such fast biodiversity change. And what this means is that if we care about conservation, we must do more than simply list species. Changes in the abundances and identities of the species that live in these environments must also be tracked. Conservation biologists will need to keep note of the species they encounter in these locations. And policymakers will have to be willing to adjust their policies to reflect these developments. McGurran and colleagues are working to create the BioTime database, a storehouse for data on ecological groups and populations, as well as how they are evolving through time. At the World Economic Forum in Davos on January 26, McGurran chatted with Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Mariette Di Cristina. MD, I'm a medical doctor, and the data set will be available soon? A. M. Yes, the data set will be made public. It's an open access data set, which means it may be used for study, teaching, and conservation by anybody in the globe. And we'd be glad to work with anyone who has data and wants to join us or contribute in any manner to the data set's preservation. Welsh is a Celtic language that is spoken by around 740,000 people in Wales and by a few hundred individuals in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina. The Welsh language is also spoken in the United Kingdom, UK, Canada, Canada, the United States, USA, Australia, Australia, and New Zealand. About half of the inhabitants of Wales spoke Welsh as their primary language at the beginning of the 20th century. There were only approximately 20% Welsh speakers in Britain by the end of the century. 582,368 individuals can speak Welsh, 659,301 can read or write it, and 797,717 claim some knowledge of the language. 28% of the population claim to know some Welsh. S4C, the Welsh language TV station, conducted a poll that found that there are around 750,000 Welsh speakers in Wales and that approximately 1.5 million people can comprehend Welsh. Moreover 133,000 Welsh speakers reside in the United Kingdom, with roughly 50,000 of them concentrated in the London region.
Welsh is a Celtic language that is spoken by around 740,000 people in Wales and by a few hundred individuals in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina. The Welsh language is also spoken in the United Kingdom, UK, Canada, Canada, the United States, USA, Australia, Australia, and New Zealand. About half of the inhabitants of Wales spoke Welsh as their primary language at the beginning of the 20th century. There were only approximately 20% Welsh speakers in Britain by the end of the century. 582,368 individuals can speak Welsh, 659,301 can read or write it, and 797,717 claim some knowledge of the language. 28% of the population claim to know some Welsh. S4C, the Welsh language TV station, conducted a poll that found that there are around 750,000 Welsh speakers in Wales and that approximately 1.5 million people can comprehend Welsh. Moreover 133,000 Welsh speakers reside in the United Kingdom, with roughly 50,000 of them concentrated in the London region. We have briefly looked at some of the problems involved running a bigger city like, say, Melbourne, keeping the road rail systems running, placing, providing food, and housing and so on. In another lecture, I'm going to deal with we must now call the megalopolis, cities with populations of 10 million or more. However, first I want to go back in history to when the population of cities could be numbered in the thousands rather than millions. One of the earliest theorists of the city was of course, Plato who created an ideal city in his text, The Republic. The population of the city would be around 25 to 30,000 at the most, oddly enough the same figures were chosen by Leonardo da Vinci for his ideal cities. Now, of these 25 to 30,000 inhabitants only about 5,000 would be citizens, a reason for this might be that it is the largest number that could be addressed publicly at one time and by one person, and makes the voting systems much easier to manage. Also, perhaps the numbers are kept deliberately low because a large population would be hard to control. All because in practical terms a few inhabitants are easy to feed from local suppliers without having to depend on outside sources. We have briefly looked at some of the problems involved running a bigger city like, say, Melbourne, keeping the road rail systems running, placing, providing food, and housing and so on. In another lecture, I'm going to deal with we must now call the megalopolis, cities with populations of 10 million or more. However, first I want to go back in history to when the population of cities could be numbered in the thousands rather than millions. One of the earliest theorists of the city was of course, Plato who created an ideal city in his text, The Republic. The population of the city would be around 25 to 30,000 at the most, oddly enough the same figures were chosen by Leonardo da Vinci for his ideal cities. Now, of these 25 to 30,000 inhabitants only about 5,000 would be citizens, a reason for this might be that it is the largest number that could be addressed publicly at one time and by one person, and makes the voting systems much easier to manage. Also, perhaps the numbers are kept deliberately low because a large population would be hard to control. All because in practical terms a few inhabitants are easy to feed from local suppliers without having to depend on outside sources. When you view this photo, you'll probably be able to tell what it is right away. It's a picture that's been seen before. It's something with which most of us are familiar, don't you think? In a doctor's office or a radiologist's office, this is a chest X-ray that would be taken. If you want to view what's inside your body, this is an excellent example of biomedical engineering since it employs physical principles, such as how do X-rays interact with your body's tissues to produce a picture of what's inside, so that you can see things you couldn't see before this gadget. You'll also recognize the ribs and bones in this image, as well as the heart, which is the enormous, glowing item at the bottom. 
The lungs can be seen as darker regions within the ribcage if you have strong distance vision and can see the veins exiting the heart and entering the lungs. When you view this photo, you'll probably be able to tell what it is right away. It's a picture that's been seen before. It's something with which most of us are familiar, don't you think? In a doctor's office or a radiologist's office, this is a chest X-ray that would be taken. If you want to view what's inside your body, this is an excellent example of biomedical engineering since it employs physical principles, such as how do X-rays interact with your body's tissues to produce a picture of what's inside, so that you can see things you couldn't see before this gadget. You'll also recognize the ribs and bones in this image, as well as the heart, which is the enormous, glowing item at the bottom. The lungs can be seen as darker regions within the ribcage if you have strong distance vision and can see the veins exiting the heart and entering the lungs.